Thank you for that lovely uh, invitation or introduction and also for the invitation to be here. This is actually my first time on Princeton's campus and I've had a lovely visit so far. Oh, and Marta's telling me to be louder, to not wander but be near the microphone. So I'll try to hover here. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is all work that's, that's really been a joint effort. Um, so I co-lead the Texas Twin Project with my academic partner, Elliot Tucker Drop. Um, we've worked closely in, in collaboration with a neuroimager, Jessica Church Lang, and the specific empirical examples I'm going to be talking about um, would not have happened without the work of our, our graduate student, Laura Inglehart, who is graduating soon, and if you ever have the opportunity to hire her, you should, um, and, and funding from a motley collection of funding from a, from a, a number of different agencies. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about just a, an introduction to the Texas Twin Project. Why would one start a twin registry? Um, what were our goals in doing that? I want to talk about how, um, how we measured children's cognitive and academic skills and also how we measured aspects of their environmental contexts, their homes, their schools, their neighborhoods. I'm going to narrow then in on one aspect of cognitive functioning, which is executive functions, um, and a new arm of research we've been doing on that related to the neural architecture of executive functions in young kids. Um, and then I actually, if, I, if we get to this point, want to broaden much back out and think about what does this research mean in terms of some of our larger debates about, um, you could frame this in a number of ways, but one way to frame it is, is about meritocracy in the United States. Okay, so the Texas Twin Project was designed um, really because I, at that time when I was starting my faculty position at Texas, I saw a need for um, additional data that was a family design, so you're really looking at um, biological relatives and also um, people who live together in the same home as an as a incredibly powerful research tool. Um, that had really in-depth measures of cognition and school achievement. So often with large cohort data sets, the measurement of cognitive ability is fairly sparse, or the measurement of um, ultimate educational attainment is there, but um, maybe not reading and math skills as kids are progressing through school. And we wanted it to be a, a contemporary cohort. And for those of you who know anything about twin research um, nationally and internationally, You'll know that one major weakness of most existing twin registries is that they're highly racially and ethnically homogenous. So they're largely drawn from northern European populations or from the state of Minnesota, which is largely people of European ancestry. Um, and so we really wanted to um, develop this resource that represented the socioeconomic and racial and ethnic diversity of, of the central Texas region. Um, it's now a, a, almost entirely based in the Austin metropolitan area. For a long time, we had a Houston arm of the study, but then our Houston collaborator was poached by Northwestern, and, and, and Northwestern is not in Texas. So our Houston arm of the Texas Twin Project collapsed. Um, I'm not going to get into this, but I, I do want to say that I'm willing to talk about this in, in conversation, which is why I think twin studies are still valuable in an era in which we can measure the genotype directly from DNA. Um, I think the, the, the classic weakness of twin studies is, is still there, which is that you can use something about them to infer that something about genetics is happening, but it's silent about biological mechanism, and that, that continues to be the case, which ge specific genetic variants remain unknown. Um, what I'm going to focus on today is I think twin studies can actually be a really um, excellent way of informing us about environmental stratification. So if we see that, um, that people differ in how well they're reading or how well they're doing in math skills, to what extent is this phenotype stratified by family after taking into account the fact that family members are genetic relatives? Uh, and I'm going to focus on that today. Um, but I can talk about some of these other issues if you have questions about them. Okay, so who are our people? So we recruit um, uh, twins or identify them through public school rosters. So really the people I'm going to be talking about today are broadly representative of school children who are enrolled in a public school in the larger Austin metropolitan area, which includes 
some densely um, populated urban areas, but also some, some not densely populated outlying rural areas. Our full sample is um, just under 2,000 youth from just about 1,000 families. You'll see the number of pairs and the number of families don't match up because we have a few families with more than one set of twins. Um, and then I'm going to be particularly focusing on our younger subsample of kids who are between um, uh, ages mostly 8 to, uh, 8 to 14. We have some people who managed to turn 15 before we could get them in the sample. Uh, mean age is 10 years old. Um, and those people have been measured most intensely with regards to cognitive and academic phenotypes. Um, what we're very happy about is that our sample is the most ethnically diverse twin sample in existence. So um, uh, just under 60% of our participants identify as non-Hispanic white, 15% identify as Hispanic, another 12% identify as multiple race and ethnicities, and this is most commonly twins who um, identify as they have one non-Hispanic white parent and one Mexican-American parent. And then sometimes you have twins who, when forced to choose a category, even though they're, they're twins, they choose different categories. And so we've, m the multiple race ethnicity uh, category is, is complicated. And we can talk about that. Um, OK, so just who are these people? Um, it really, these are public school children. And so we're really capturing, to some extent, the extent to which school children in Austin are experiencing some level of financial stress in the home. And just as some um, illustrative data points to, to talk about that, about a third of our um, parents whom we survey report that they've had serious financial problems where they've been unable to pay their bills in the last six years. Another third, and these overlap, um, report that they've received some sort of needs-based public assistance since the twins were born. This is most commonly SNAP or WIC. Um, and then 15% of our sample report some level of food insecurity in the past year. So, so concerns about not having enough money for groceries or concerns about ha having inadequate nutritional resources for the children. Um, our twins, this is a map of Austin, and a green dot represents one of, where one of our twin families lives. So these are um, spread over 239 census tracts, and so we've matched our families to information from the American Community Survey about um, various aspects of the neighborhood. And I realize now that this screen is not large enough that you can um, read this in great detail. What I just want to point out, for instance, is say, for instance, this is the proportion of residents in a neighborhood that has um, received a high school education. This dot here represents our median neighborhood. So the median neighborhood that our kids reside in, um, about 80% of kids, of residents in that neighborhood have received a high school education, have finished high school. But that varies dramatically from near unity to down to less than a quarter, um, which I think is one way of um, illustrating that even within a single metropolitan area, I think when people hear Texas, they have one stereotype. When people think Austin, they have another stereotype. But obviously, people's lived experiences within those stereotypes can vary quite dramatically in terms of what the neighborhoods look like. Um, another one that you can think of here is, um, and this is a, a big driver of, of differences between neighborhoods in Austin, which is the proportion of residents that report that they're Hispanic. Our median neighborhood is about a quarter, but that ranges from over 90% to, to almost zero. Okay. Um, they also are coming not just from Austin ISD, but from a number of surrounding school districts outside of Austin. Um, so they're actually in 230 different elementary, middle, and high schools in the full sample. And these are also quite variable. So I think the most evocative thing here we can think of is the number of children within a school that one of our twins attends that uh, qualifies for free or reduced price lunch. So the median school is just about 25%, but that ranges from schools. There is a school in which zero children have um, free or reduced price lunch. I know exactly where that school is. Um, and up to schools where upwards of 90% qualify. You can also think about this in terms of the average level of um, uh, mathematics and reading achievement in the school. So Texas. As you might imagine, since George Bush was governor of Texas before he was president of the United States, we've been a long adopter of um, high-stakes standardized testing. Um, all school children in Texas and public schools have to do those um, at the end of every year, beginning at age uh, at grade three. Um, and so this is uh, whether kids in that school have met 
statewide standards, say, for reading or math ability. Um, so, you know, our average school is doing okay with just under 75% of students meeting that standard, but a lot of variability there ranging from around 10% up to, to near unity. So the point here that I'm, I'm getting is that we have been trying to catch a really wide net. So if you're thinking about all of the different ways in which the, the, the family, the neighborhood, the school experiences of children in Austin vary, um, how can we sample broadly across the metropolitan area to develop a resource, um, a large resource of twins that are experiencing different aspects of these these elements of the home, family, and school environment that we think might be relevant for the development of their cognitive and academic skills. Okay. So um, one thing that we did after we collected a large amount of data is that we then tried to reduce it. Um, so this is work that my graduate student did, um, basically taking a number of different um, uh, data sources from the parents from the Texas Educational Agency report on schools and from the American Community Survey on neighborhoods and um, reducing it using principal con components analysis to come up with um, nine broad dimensions of socioeconomic adversity, right? So this is um, the outlier here is interparental conflict, which didn't seem to hang with anything else. But we can think about, for example, when we're thinking about schools, how well are the teachers paid? What are the student demographics on average in the school? To what extent are low-income children clustered within a school? And then, you know, how well is the school performing with regards to math and math and reading achievement? Similar sort of data reduction with with um, the neighborhood. Okay. Um, so we're going to come back to why and how these things matter, but I, what I want to leave you with is that this was created in part to be this ongoing resource for genetically informed research on child and adolescent development. We continue to add new families to our project and also to follow them as they move into adolescence. Um, and we are very, very open to ideas for collaboration or people who want to use our data in ways that we haven't thought of yet. Um, so if any of you are interested or you think, I wonder if you've measured this that I'm also analyzing in my survey, please ask me because we have measured a lot about these people that I'm just barely skimming the surface on. Okay. The thing that we um, may have paid particular attention to in this study is measuring kids' child, child um, or their cognitive and academic skills. So what I'm going to go through now are, I would say, three major domains of cognition um, that we spend a lot of time measuring. And these um, go from more complex and more dependent on instruction to more basic and less dependent on instruction. Okay. So at the broadest level, we are measuring their um, abilities in reading and math. And we do this in the lab with a Woodcock-Johnson test. Um, so this is basically just giving them passages of text and asking them if they can questions to test whether they comprehend it. Um, or giving them um, applied calculus problems, or not calculus problems, calculation problems, right, where they need to add or subtract numbers, or applied problems, or what, um, I don't know, in the 80s we called word problems. Um, this is actually stolen from my aunt's Facebook page because she is a public school teacher in Texas. Um, STAR is the state mandated test of academic achievement. Um, and so we are in the process of coding the transcripts of all of our participants to see not just how did they perform in the lab, but how did they perform on high sex testing day when they showed up in the school. So I'm, I'm excited to maybe this, maybe six months from now have some data relevant to that. Um, we gave them a WASI, which is an abbreviated test of intelligence, and you can divide this into two general domains. The first is verbal ability or verbal reasoning skills. So the classic test of that is um, similarities. So in what way are a dog and a goat alike? Okay. So a one-point answer to that question would be like you use a dog to herd goats, um, something about their, their concrete functional relationship. But the best possible answer, according to this, is, well, a dog and a goat are both mammals. Something that allows you to, can you think about things in terms of their abstract categories? Visual spatial reasoning is to what extent can you reason about novel problems that don't depend on language, okay? So the classic tests of these, in case you haven't given or received an IQ test recently, are matrix reasoning in which people are given um, 
this kind of matrix of pictures and asked to reason about which of the answers fits in with that the best. Or block design, where they're given an abstract picture and given a certain amount of time to, to reconstruct that picture. These can be combined into um, a measure of full-scale IQ. This is on our classic IQ um, scale, where in the population you would expect people to have a mean of about 100. We were very, very happy to find that after giving IQ tests to 2,000 kids, our mean IQ in our sample is 103, which is pretty much exactly what you would expect if you're sampling from public school children and you're, you're representing um, that range. I, what I have here are the correlations for these abilities for identical twins versus fraternal twins. So identical twins are the ones that look just alike. Um, one egg, one sperm divided, oops, divided too much. Now we have two people. Um, fraternal twins clearly being two <coughs> eggs, two sperm, just like normal siblings that happen to share a pregnancy. Um, and we'll get into the logic of comparing MC twins to DZ twins in a second. Um, but for those of you who are familiar with this line of research, this is very consistent with what other established twin studies have found, um, both in North America and in Northern Europe. Okay. The third broad domain that we're measuring is executive function. Executive functioning is something that, it's actually a, it's a term that people use in different branches of the social sciences to refer to different types of abilities. So for instance, economists are much more likely to use the phrase non-cognitive skills or soft skills. Sometimes clinical psychologists refer to executive functions to, re to refer to things like personality traits like impulse control. We actually take um, a cognitive science view of what executive functions is, which is the ability to flexibly allocate attention. So um, it's not about eating marshmallows or not eating marshmallows. We're not talking about um, personality skills about delaying gratification or impulse control in the, in the, in the face of a reward. Um, we're thinking about core, um, core basic component cognitive processes that scaffold and are necessary for more complex reasoning. So it's a really cognitive science-based view of executive functioning. Um, and I, I, I'm perseverating on that point because I think it's really clear, it, it needs to be clear to avoid um, misunderstandings about what I mean when I talk about EF, what do I mean by when I talk about executive functioning. So we are measuring four broad domains of executive functioning. One is inhibition, which is your inability to, your ability to stop a prepotent or learned response. So um, one example for this is people are told to press a button um, in this way when the arrow is pointing this way, press a different button when the arrow presses this other way, and then occasionally they hear a tone and they're asked to not press anything, right? So you've learned to do this, and now you're told stop. Can you stop doing it? Switching is, to what extent, when you've learned a rule for something, can you switch rules, right? So, um, for instance, you, you are doing this task, and then all of a sudden, the, um, the experimenter says, okay, now I want you to do the task differently, and now I want you to go back, okay? So, for instance, you might be asked to trace something between, I want you to trace all the faces, and then now I want you to trace all the colors, and now I want you to go, face to color, face to color, face to color, okay? So again, you need to flexibly adapt what you're paying attention to to do a switching task. Working memory is to what extent can you keep small amounts of information in working memory? <laughs> so if I said the digits five, one, seven, nine, four, could you repeat them back to me? Um, updating is if I said I want you to keep track of the lowest number I've said. Five, one, seven, nine, four, zero. Right? You had to get rid of the one and then you had to update with the zero. Okay? So it's, it's manipulating working memory in, in, in your head and, and updating it as you go. Um, we've measured each of those domains with three tasks. And the reason why we've, we've done this is because, as we'll see, each one of these tasks is pretty messy. Um, and I'll come back to that point in a second. All right. So y'all have probably seen this before. This is a basic biometric model or a twin model. And what you're doing is you're taking the relative similarity of identical twins for something you've measured, comparing that to the similarity between fraternal twins for something you've measured, and, and inferring from that comparison something about the ways 
in which genetic differences between people and environmental differences between people contribute to variation. Most of the time when people hear twin studies, they think heritability, and that's not actually the part that I want you to pay attention to today. What I want you to pay attention to today is this C component here, which is what behavior geneticists often refer to as the shared environment. You see C variants when children raised in the same home are more similar, regardless of their zygosity, for what you've measured above and beyond what you can account for by their genetic resemblance to one another. Okay. So if I had a sample of adoptees and I looked at how similar are two adoptees raised in the same home for something I've measured about them, that would be a great um, measure of the shared environment because they have no biological relationship between them. Unfortunately, adoptee samples are harder to come by than twins that you can recruit from a public school roster. So this is why we're doing it this way. We have a racially and ethnically diverse sample, and we're including race as a covariate. This is self-identified racial category um, as, as a covariate in all of our analyses, basically because we think that there are racialized differences in children's experiences dating from, from the children's lifespan from conception that even with all that we're measuring about their environment, we're still not capturing. And so I don't want this to be in any way interpreted as some sort of like, um, this component has nothing necessarily to do with genes, even though I'm doing twin studies. And I think that's a very important point. OK. And then what we can do is we include a lot of other measured covariates. These are these dimensions of environmental experience that I talked about earlier. Um, and what we're doing here is we're trying to estimate the extent to which children show between family environmental stratification and the different cognitive skills we've measured. And then to what extent can we account for that with the things that we've actually measured about their environment? <coughs> so this is a complex graph. Um, so I'm going to talk to you through, through it with you in a couple of places. So the first thing that we have here on the y-axis is that C variance that I just talked about. So this is the proportion of variance, proportion of individual differences, you can think of this as an R squared, in something we've measured that we can attribute to some aspect of the environment shared by kids raised in the same home, above and beyond their genetic resemblance. Okay. So the first thing I want you to notice is that this, this is not zero, one. I think a lot of times people talk about twin studies as if they pro prove that family environments don't matter, and that does not fit with my experience with twin studies or running one. Um, and that also, it increases to the extent that the outcome is dependent on instruction, or, or in one way to think about it, actually given deliberate instruction, right? So in school, children are not taught how to do matrix reasoning tasks. They are taught how to add. Um, schools vary in the level of their instruction. So maybe it's not surprising that as we get from IQ to math skills, we get a larger degree of the shared environmental stratification between families and the outcome. The green part of that bar is the portion of that shared environmental variance that we could not statistically account for with all of the stuff we measured about the kids in their homes. Um, so in genetics, people talk about a missing heritability problem, which is that we know things are heritable, but we're not really sure what the specific genetic variants are. One way to think about this is as a missing environmentality problem, and that we're seeing stratification between families that's environmental in their reading and math skills. We have measured a ton about these kids, and we still can't statistically account for it. There's some problems there because things you measure about the kids' environment aren't necessarily exogenous to their genotypes and the way that measuring their genotypes are. Um, but we, to the extent that we're just trying to statistically soak up as much of that variance we can with measurement, um, we can't for reading and math skills. Yeah? Uh, is that corrected for measurement error? And if so, or either way, so for full-scale IQ, there's, you can explain all of C with these, like, yeah. Doesn't measure variables. That seems shocking to me. Yeah. Um, yes. So it does correct for measurement error in, in two ways. One is that um, these are 
Um, almost all of these models are done on latent variables, and so measurement and um, error is going to be really at the indicator level. And two, to the extent that you would see measurement error on an indicator variable, that would be manifested in the non-shared environmental component, right? Because noise is going to make kids, kids raised in the same home who are genetically identical more different from one another. Um, and three, yeah, it, 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 is, it is somewhat surprising. Although, I mean, this is, I don't know, we measured a lot about them. I, our, people's intuitions vary as to whether that's a surprising or unsurprising result. I think what's more interesting is we can do that about measured IQ. We can't about reading and math skills, right? So something about the, if we think of this as environmental variance in whether or not children can read a passage of text and tell you what it means or add and subtract, we're not capturing all of the relevant environmental variables there. Yeah. Question? So the indicator here is like your, your answer to each question and the latent variable is your latent IQ. Yeah, so in the, in the, um, in the IQ instance, for instance, we have the, two sub, the, the scale scores on the two subtests for visual-spatial reasoning, the scale scores for verbal ability, and then we have a latent factor on top of that, and similar for verbal and math. I'm about to show you what that looks like for executive functioning, so I think it'll clarify that question. Okay. So you'll notice that executive functioning isn't on this graph, um, and that's because unlike IQ or reading or math ability, executive functioning didn't show any evidence of shared environmental influence in our sample. Okay. So this is, for those of you who don't speak or, or read structural equation modeling, I know this is a really... Um, this is what my advisor from grad school would call a spaghetti graph, like you just threw a bunch of spaghetti on a plate and this is what it looks like. So let me just walk you through it a little bit. So on the bottom graph of the, of the, of the graph here, what we have is our, our indicator. So these are the 12 measures of execu executive function that, that came from our battery. Each of these is, con three of these are considered indicators of each of our four domains of executive functioning. And so we can think of these factor loadings squared as the percent variance in performance on an individual task accounted for by that domain, the domain level ability. Um, what you can see here is that the, these factor loadings are fine but not spectacular. So there's a, there's a significant amount of um, what I personally think of as noise or unreliability of measurement in an in-back task or a working measurement task. What we have then here is each of these broad domains of executive functioning are modeled as indicators of a, of a common executive functioning. Um, so this is basically capturing the fact that kids who are really good at inhibition tasks are also really good at switching tasks, are also good at working memory tasks, are also good at updating tasks. And this fits with our idea that executive function at its core is this ability to flexibly allocate attention. And that helps you in any of the more specific manifestations of executive functioning. Now, what we've done at both the task-specific level, the domain-specific level, and the general, the general factor level is then use the similarity between twins to, that, to fit that biometric model. Okay? And so what I want to call your attention to here is one of the most surprising results of my scientific career, which is that this common executive functioning, uh, we, we saw basically nearly perfect heritability of that um, in a sample of kids where the mean age is 10. Um, this is surprising because that's the sort of heritability that you usually observe for um, traits like height, right? So traits that are measured very, very reliably, which in this case the latent factor is because we've, we've sussed out a lot of the measurement error at the indicator level. Um, and also you typically see for things that heritability is increased with development. You don't typically see heritability this high this early in childhood. We were skeptical of this result, um, and then a lab from Colorado collected our, the exact same me battery of measures and did this same measurement model in, um, in a sample of 17-year-olds, and they found the exact same result. So we were both faced with this like, independent replication of this near-perfect heritability of executive functioning in childhood. Okay. So, one thing that I want to you all to take away from this, and I, and I think this is actually really important for people um, who primarily analyze secondary data, um, which I've spent a, a chunk of my career also being in that position, which is that cognitive phenotypes are not interchangeable. So I think a lot of times when we're working with big data sets, 
we can think of, well, this data set has a you know, Peabody picture, picture vocabulary test, and this one has a Ravens, and this one measures how far you go in school, and we're all talking about the same thing. And I don't, I don't actually think that's true. Um, I think in some cases that's a reasonable assumption, but I, don't, I think that we should be wary of treating all cognitive phenotypes as interchangeable. And one is that I think those, those between family environmental gaps widen as skills become more complex and more instruction dependent. Okay? Whereas with our really like basic cognitive skills, this, like this ability to flexibly allocate attention, even though we have gone through a lot of effort to bring 2,000 children from all over the Austin metropolitan area into our lab and measure everything we possibly can about their schools and their environment, we actually see no evidence that the variation in environmental experience within our sample makes much of a difference in terms of accounting for differences in executive functioning. Now, I will say that these are all kids who have one thing in common, which is that they're all exposed to school. And we've been um, in collaborating, that's a loose word, but communicating with an anthropologist who's going to be um, perhaps administering some of these tests in, in populations where they vary in access to schooling. So I think let's not underestimate. I don't. I don't want to. I mean, it's perfectly heritable. I'm not making claims about it being innate, right? These are all children who have spent eight hours a day, 180 days a year for multiple years of their life, sitting in school, which I think trains executive. It train. It trains the flexible allocation of attention. And then finally, we still have missing environmentality for reading and math achievement. Um, is this instructional quality? Is this some sort of unmeasured aspect of the home environment? There's a lot of stuff that that could be. If y'all have thoughts about what we could add, especially as we get further into our schools, um, we're open to that. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about this really briefly, mostly because it's new research um, and also because I'm not a neuroimager. Um, so I'm really stealing Laura's thunder here, but I think it's interesting to think about um, this result in relation to what's happening in the child's brain while they do these tasks. So we have a subsample of our kids who have come in for an imaging visit, um, collect task space and resting state fMRI data, um, and 52 twin pairs and 13 individuals whose co-twins were not scanned. I was telling people at dinner last night, the biggest problem we have is braces. Braces are... <laughs> Like, Texas parents' com commitment to braces is really, like, one of the biggest practical problems I deal with in my life, honestly. Um, so what we had is, in addition to their behavioral visit, we had kids do one task for each of three domains of executive functioning. Um, it turns out that working memory and updating tasks really tap very similar neural regions, and so they just did an updating task, not a, an updating and a separate working memory task. Um, and what we were interested in here is um, what regions in the brain are reliably active when children are performing these executive functioning tasks in the scanner? And what's more important is how does that neural architecture, how does that set of brain regions compared to the set of brain regions that we know are active when adults do this thing. Right? So one hypothesis would be, I mean, if you, if you look at levels of performance in executive functioning between an 8-year-old and a 30-year-old, thankfully, 30-year-olds are much, much better at these tasks, right? There's a huge amount of cognitive development and improvement that's happening during this period of time, right? And some of our, some of our sort of the neural architecture undergoing, like undergirding some functions really shows protracted development through adolescence, not just quantitatively, but qualitatively, which regions are involved. So what we did is we looked at, um, so what we have here are regions of the brain in which chil that children are engaging when they're um, doing two of the tasks, and then the black regions are the regions that are active when all three, when, during all three tasks. And the dots here are the, um, are hypothesized regions of interest based on the adult literature. And basically what we find here is that the network of brain regions that adults engage when they're doing executive functioning is already online. It's already the, the network of brain regions that you see are active in a sample of 7 to 12 year olds. Okay? 
So we're not only just seeing really early high heritability, we're seeing this early canalization of the neural architecture undergirding these functions. Um, I'll skip that. Okay. Um, what we're doing with this now empirically is that we are, um, I mean, we have a sample of kids um, where we have a, a very um, in-depth measure of executive functioning, and we know that that measure of in-depth in measure of, of executive functioning is is acting as a is a pretty low contamination index of genetic differences between people. And then now they're about to go through adolescence and about to pass through the peak period of risk for the onset of a number of psychiatric and behavioral problems. So how much can we prospectively predict about where these kids are going in terms of their, their psychiatric and physical health based on this, er, this early manifestation of, of executive functioning deficits? That's where we're going with this, pending there still being an NIH in existence. Um, OK. So. Let me, I'm about to switch gears. Let me stop there and see if there's any empirical questions that are, that are burning anyone's brain. Nothing. I'm just like, now I want to know what you're going to switch gears to. Okay, all right. Um, so, so I have been doing twin research for a while. And, and so I'm just sort of personally familiar with the fact that if you start talking about genetic differences in cognitive ability, genetic differences in intelligence, genetic differences in intelligence that are manifest and measured early in development, that that can be a, a controversial, and I think that's putting it mildly, research area. This is an area in which people have a lot of intuitions that, and, and the line of research can make them uncomfortable. And I think um, this reaction to things, um, I think, is really well summarized by this um, article that came out in National Geographic magazine in response to um, an earlier iteration of a genome-wide association study of educational attainment. And it was titled, Are There Genes for Intelligence and Is It Racist to Ask? Right? And so one of, some of the commenters to that article said, that there's no way that studying the genetics of intelligence, which is what I just showed you, right? And it's a twin study in which I've measured cognitive abilities in a lot of people, can be social ne neutral and, in fact, will intensify social inequalities. Um, Charles Murray is not a behavioral geneticist, um, and he doesn't do active empirical research, but he's more than happy to talk about it in the service of being controversial. Um, and. And what's interesting about that, from my perspective, is that it is a, is a foil that draws out a lot of people's responses and their intuitions about what this research means. So this was a statement by the Columbia Law School in response to an invitation for Charles Murray to speak. Um, and they said, well, by talking about gene pools as responsible for the stratification of American society, this is individualizing and naturalizing success and failure underwriting the libertarian case that government measures to address systemic forces that create economic disparity are unnecessary. So there's really this idea, they're, they're, I think they're, they're kind of trying to articulate what is it about this that makes us unhappy or uncomfortable. And one of the things that they're coming at, which is not the whole argument, but one of the things <laughs> they're coming up with is, if you tie genetics to intelligence and then you tie intelligence to economic success in American life, does that necessarily lend support to an ideology, in this case a far-right ideology, that I, don't, that I don't buy, that I don't believe in, right? So they're trying to articulate the reasoning behind some of this, um, mm -hmm. this intuitive displeasure with this line of research. Um, this is the most recent example. So the sociologist Catherine Blitz just wrote a book, which I feel like I'm the last geneticist in the world to have not read yet, um, called Social by Nature. But what caught, caught a lot of people's attention is that the book review in Nature Genetics um, was titled CRISPR's Willing Executioners about the researchers involved. Uh, many people noted that this showed a, 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 an uncomfortable parallel with a book about <coughs> Germans who collaborated with the Nazi regime in the Holocaust, Hitler's Willing Executioners, and they thought, 
oh, oh, there's an article in Nature Genetics in which I've been sort of indirectly compared to Hitler. This, this has gone bad. Um, okay, so some people have commented that this intuition, this intuitive discomfort that people often have, um, both amongst academics and the lay public, about studying genetics of intelligence, doesn't bubble up with the same fervor when people talk about the genetics of other phenotypes. So um, this is from a libertarian blogger who noted that if people talk about the genetics of weight, or if they talk about the genetics of schizophrenia, or if they talk about the genetics of mental illness or depression, then that doesn't usually trigger some sort of liberal intuition that this is bad or scary, but that when we talk about the genetics of intelligence or achievement, it does. And he just really just kind of puts that out there. It's like, this is my observation. Um, I have no hard data on that, but that's an observation that I'll agree with. So my, my sense, or my hypothesis, my kind of working, working theory um, about why you might see this discomfort is, is two things. One is that it's really easy for researchers such as myself to study to the genetics of intelligence, to study how genotypes contribute to educational attainment without acknowledging that these things that we're studying, like intelligence or conscientiousness or educational attainments, aren't just behaviors, but they're morally relevant to people. And, and I say morally relevant in the, in the sense that they are relevant to people's um, moral intuitions, and also they figure into larger moral questions, so two ways. One is that we make judgments, both intuitive judgments and, and judgments as a society about who deserves what, judgments about dessert. Um, and two, the whole question of distributive justice, which is how should we divide goods between people, that's a moral question, and the way that our society has currently answered that is we divide it up according to education. So I think my, what I'm positing to you, and I'm interested, in, this is a conversation that I'm having with people right now. I'm positing to you that part of the reason that people are uncomfortable by research on the genetics of intelligence in a way that they're not uncomfortable about research on the genetics of body weight is that we're not dividing up who makes money and who doesn't make money in our society based on body weight. But we are on the basis of education, and educational success is tied to intelligence. And so it really activates some, I think, uncomfortable questions about distributive justice, what's fair, what is deserved, what do people deserve. And that might be underlying some of the, the agita that we get around intel executive function is is perfectly heritable at the age of 10 in a way that we don't about height is, is perfectly heritable at the age of 10. Um, Thomas Nagel in his 1979 book, Mortal Questions, put it this way, which is something in the idea of agency is in incompatible with actions being events or people being things. Um, and I think genetic research, to the extent that it's perceived as reductionist, to the extent that, we, that it's perceived as making people into things, um, threatens our idea of agency. And if we've been, been sold the idea that we are free agents who you know, can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and, and succeed in this meritocratic ideal, then those seem to be really conflicting um, sort of messages. All right. Uh, there's been some, some kind of this like constant every five or 10 years or so chorus of Hmong people on the left saying, basically, we don't need to fear biology. Um, so one example would be Peter Singer's. This is not so much about genetics as theories of evolution, but Peter Singer's our Darwinian left. Um, another example is my advisor from graduate school, Eric Turkheimer, who wrote a chapter called In Search of a Psychometric Left. And so Eric wrote this 20, 20 years ago. And I think he, he, he led, really, with this question, which is, in order to oppose racist or determinist amounts of accounts of behavior, is it necessarily necessary to believe that there is no such thing as human ability or that abilities are in no way transmitted between generations along genetic pathways? Right. And I, 
a part of my interest in this is that I think the, the latter part of this is a fairly well-settled empirical question. That, you know, if we call ability, how well can you flexibly allocate attention in the lab? There are individual differences in that. And it does predict how well kids go in school. And I do think it's transmitted between generations along genetic pathways. Um, but I also think that that doesn't commit me to the sort of political implications that is implied by, say, the faculty statement on Charles Murray. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over that. I will, uh, we've already talked about Charles Murray. We don't have to talk about him more. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the, the subject of my new, my new line of research. It's funded by the Templeton Foundation. It's part of their Genetics and Human Agency Initiative. And it's basically grappling with this question, which is, if I don't think that believing that executive functioning being heritable at the age of 10 commits you to you know, a libertarian case that redistribution is, is worthless. Like, well, what does it commit it to? Does, does it commit you to anything? Does, does it just have no political implications? Or does it have maybe surprising political implications that someone's really thought through in a, in a particularly reasoned way? Um, and this, this is like, this is really new for me. I'm not a philosopher. So this is, this is a conversation. <laughs> um, but my starting point for that conversation is in the philosophy of luck, right? So luck um, has been defined in a variety of different ways because that's how philosophers like to do it. They don't like to stick with one construct definition the way that behavioral scientists do. But, but three conditions of something being lucky is that it's a chance event that is outside of the control of the agent and is significant to the agent. And I think the paradigmatic case of, of luck in the philosophy of literature is a lottery, right? You buy a lottery ticket, and you know it was not your Powerball number. But there is an alternative possible world in which those Powerball numbers were the ones you that you bought, right? You, that you won the lottery. And and Mendelian inheritance is is a lottery, right? So if we're talking about you know, you have, a, you have a set of parental genotypes and you're going to get this one or this one, this allele or this allele. That is by definition a lottery, okay? Um, so that's, you know, I got this allele from my dad and I could have gotten this one. Um, but there's tons of alleles that I wasn't at risk of inheriting because my parents didn't have them. But those are the initial conditions, right? So if we, if we think about, this is Pritchard, who's one of the kind of, I think, most interesting philosophers of luck working right now. He describes that what makes an event lucky is that while it obtains in the actual world, there are keeping the initial conditions for that event fixed, close possible worlds in which this event does not obtain. Okay. So um, well, keeping the initial conditions of what parental genotypes I had, it's clearly lucky that I inherited this allele versus that allele. But their genotypes were determined by that exact same lottery process, right? Which, which alleles did they get from their parents versus their parents? And if we think of initial conditions as lucky in the parental genotype way, we can actually think of genetic inheritance as this multi-generational lottery process, right? It's, it's pushing our initial conditions sort of ad infinitum into our ancestral path. And, and if you take that argument seriously, that ends up with your genotype is lucky. It is, it is a form of philosophical luck, which actually, happily for me, coincides with Nagel's theory of, of constitutive luck. Um, why does that matter? Why is that interesting? Well, so I think it's interesting just because I, I have been sucked into this literature enough to find the philosophy of luck interesting. But I think it's useful, actually. Because luck is a, is a concept around which there is a huge and well-developed philosophical literature. Does luck mitigate moral responsibility? Is there such a thing as moral luck? How should the effects of luck be neutralized in order to achieve justice? These are questions that much smarter people than I have have spent a lot of time thinking about. And I think what's useful about that is it gets us as genetic scientists out of trying to come up with some like whole hog from scratch theory of what genes mean 
to thinking about, well, there are frameworks for thinking about justice. How does what we do fit into them? So for instance, some people think that lotteries are the most fair way to distribute resources. And any distribution that occurs from lotteries uh, can't possibly un be unjust. Which is a very different way of thinking about it than, say, a luck egalitarian, which would say that in order to achieve justice, we need to neutralize the effects of luck on the population. And once you start thinking about the space in which luck is played out, where I'm coming to is I don't think there's one set of philosophical or ethical implications of genetic research. I think there's people's a priori ideologies that, that genetic research can fit into you know, more or less consistently. Um, this is what I'm working on now. Uh, I would love to talk to you all about that. Um, what I found, I've given versions of this talk three times, and what I've learned is that this is something that, like, it tends to like marry in people for a while, and then I get emails about three weeks after I give a talk. Um, and I love that. I learned so much from people emailing me. After talk. So if you have thoughts about this, even if it's, I read this thing when I was a sophomore philosophy major, and I'm not sure if it's relevant. I probably have not read that since I was a sophomore philosophy major, and, and we can talk about it. So um, I'm going to end there. Uh, I sometimes blog about this badly and sometimes post about those blogs on Twitter, so that's a good way to find out like when I'm perseverating on on a more up-to-date basis. Um, that's my lab website. You're free to email me and I'm happy to take questions.